Well, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I'm glad that, that you are able to be here in church. It's so good to be able to see your faces. So, well, most of your faces. I'm seeing a lot of half faces anyway. It's good to be able to see your eyes this morning. How about that? I'm glad that, that you're here with us today. We do have a few announcements as we begin our service this morning. Um, as we have been doing for the last several months now. Uh, no offering plates are being passed. There will be the basket in the back at the back of the, oh. of the sanctuary where you will be uh, able to drop off your tithe, your offering. Of course, we are still having folks who are mailing, mailing those in, and that is still perfectly acceptable. And there's also still the option of online giving. And if you want more information about the online giving, please uh, contact us uh, at the church website or through the church email, or text me, or call me, or call Sam. Somebody will be able to, to answer your call at some point, answer your question about online giving if you're still interested in going that route. Uh, we will dismiss, at the end of our service today, we will dismiss row by row, and uh, that will be, again, something I give you, that gives you the opportunity to, uh, to visit out in the, out in the uh, parking lot, in that area and not to create a bottleneck situation here in the in the sanctuary so please know that at the end of the service you will be dismissed please wait for that uh, the Christian Education Committee will meet this Tuesday at 6 p.m. if you're or 6 30 rather p.m. if you're on that committee or part of the nursery committee please uh, you've probably been contacted by now uh, if you haven't talk to Cameron after uh, the service and we'll figure out uh, where you need to be on that particular meeting. What we're doing is trying to get together to make sure that we have all of the uh, all of the things in place so that we can start back with Sunday school, with small groups, all of those kinds of things, uh, making sure that those are uh, still things that we need to do and, and looking forward to the, to the future as how we're going to do those things. So right now, every option is on the table, and that's what we tried to tell the Board of Stewards the other night, every option is on the table as far as how Sunday school, how small groups go. And so there might be some changes that you see coming along. If there are, roll with them. I heard a really interesting uh, a prayer this past week that was, God, when I'm facing the, the storm of life, help me to be a blade of grass. God, when I am facing a wall that someone has built in my way to get the, the gospel message out, help me to be a strong gale of wind. And I, I, I love that idea because it talks about how we have to be able to roll with the punches. We have to be able to adapt to the things that are coming our way. We have to be able to, to take whatever the situation is that we're in and allow God to use us in that situation. It's not situational ethics. Our, our belief, our morality doesn't change in those situations. But often God needs us to be a blade of grass where we are able to to, uh, uh, to wait out that storm. And sometimes he needs us to, to go ahead with all of the force of a, of a hurricane and uh, move forward and move into whatever situation it is that he has us moving. So our prayer is that God will give us the wisdom to be whichever of those we need to be. That went really long. Thank you. It's a nice prayer. Possibly half of my sermon right there. So hopefully that didn't cut too much into the sermon time. We'll take away from sermon time. All right. <laughs> Moving forward. Sorry, that's a joke for Sam and me. Sorry for the rest of you. Uh, we do have a prayer walk still scheduled for August the 30th. That is next Sunday evening. Um, it is determine your own hours. If you would like to do that early in the morning before you come to church next Sunday, if you would like to do that after dark next Sunday, if you'd like to do that in the middle of the afternoon, I don't know why you'd want to do that in the middle of the afternoon, but if you would like to do that, it's that opportunity is there. So I'm, we're certainly letting people know that next Sunday we are uh, letting people go pray around your schools. Um, if you are in the Robinson area and you'd like to go and pray around schools there, fantastic. If you are, if you are in Troy, if you are in Lorena, if you are in one of the other outlying areas and you would like to go and pray around one of those schools, if you're over in Waco, absolutely. However it is, Wherever you are, please be in prayer for our teachers, our students, uh, administrators, all of the staff that works in order to keep the school running. Uh, please be in prayer for, for 
uh, we always do this time of year, but please, this time of, this year especially, please be in prayer for our students and our teachers and staff and all of the folks who are involved in school and making school what it is. Uh, speaking of school, we have a back-to-school retreat that's on the books for September 5 through 7. That's uh, a Labor Day weekend. Cameron, do you have something that you want to tell us about that? Just keeping with the theme of being flexible and rolling with the punches, or is that, maybe you didn't use that phrase. Anyway, um, going with whatever's thrown at us, um, that, that'll definitely be a theme for this retreat. But it's happening. Um, today's the deadline for sign up because there's some uh, logging of temperatures and stuff like that that we'll have to do. Um, so if you have someone, a uh, youth that's interested in going, please let me know today and I'll get you everything you need. We've done what we can to make it relatively painless, but, but there are some extra steps this time just because <coughs> COVID. Um, but anyway, please be in prayer for that. We're, we think we know what we're doing, but this is different. Um, so it's exciting and scary. Um, so pray for, for all that goes on at the retreat. Um, and for those going, and if you have someone interested in going, tell me today. All right. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, and, and again, I love the phrase, because of COVID, because that's just the world that we live in right now. So that's, uh, that's the situation. That's where we're going. Please uh, also don't forget to put the back-to-school retreat on your, uh, on your prayer list for this next week. Uh, we do have Interchurch Council on the books for September, I'm sorry, for Saturday, October the 3rd. Uh, so we have a little over a month before that happens that we'll be down in College Station. And if you want more information in regards to where that's going to be and when we're going to leave here and all that kind of stuff, more information will be coming in uh, uh, shortly in, in the weeks that are right ahead of us here. Uh, I'm, I think I've heard where it's going to be in College Station, but I'm not 100% sure. It's going to be in a different location than, than ESCON. Is that correct? The Holiday Inn Express, Holiday Inn Express down there. So we'll probably try to have a group go from here and uh, go down there for that. But as I said, more information in the weeks to come. Uh, noticed on the sign-up sheet on the uh, lawn care team taking care of the church grass. I know it's summertime. I know it's August. Not a whole lot of growing going on. But uh, I noticed that only James has signed up on that. So James, thank you. Calling you out. Thank you, sir, for being our new Ed. <laughs> I wish that I could bring you both up here together and show you the extremes between James and Ed, but there's really not. They're both good-hearted men, and I love you both. So anyway, if you would like to uh, sign up for that, please do so. Uh, if you need any other information in regards to uh, mowing or anything like that, please talk to John Johansson. Uh, after the service or give John a call sometime during the week. And as usual, for any more information about these announcements or anything else, please, uh, uh, or to view the recorded services, go to BethelMethodist.com slash Robinson, and that's where all of that information is. Any other announcements? Good. I'm tired of talking. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these announcements. We thank you for the opportunity to be reminded of all of the ways that you call us to serve, whether it's taking care of, of uh, things here around the, the physical plant of this building, whether it's taking care of needs that we have within our community through uh, different ministries that, that we have within the community, whether it's uh, reminding about those folks who are involved in, in school, involved in, in preparing to go back to school, preparing for different things that go on around us. Father, thank you for the reminders this morning through these announcements and through so many other ways, the fact that, that you call us to be aware, you call us to be involved, you call us to, to care about those things that are going on around us. And so, Father, as we begin the service this morning, we begin by saying thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us the opportunity and the strength and the health to be able to be here this morning. Thank you, Lord God, for the ways that you are working in our lives and through our lives. Thank you, Lord God, for the things that you have brought us through this past week. Father, I have no idea. Some of the folks in our church go through some terrible things every week, things that would, that would crush me, things that would, if it was me, I would think, how in the world do I get up tomorrow morning? And yet you give grace, you give your strength, you give yourself in order to encourage, in order to strengthen, in order to, to remind us that you alone are God. In you is all that we need. 
Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for your presence with us this morning as we gather together in this place. I thank you, Father, that you have gone before us, that you have prepared this place. I thank you, Father, that you are, that you are here with us now. I thank you, Lord God, that you will have gone before us when we leave this place, and that you will have prepared our pathway as we go from this place later. But right now, Lord God, we thank you that you are here. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit ministering to us, helping us, shaping us, molding us, convicting us where there is need for correction in our lives, strengthening us, Lord God, that we can be your people. Thank you, Father, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Show of hands, does anybody think that Jerry ever gets tired of talking? Another show of hands. Uh, anybody missing the slides this morning? Uh, uh, yeah, this this is this book is a is known as a hymnal. You you may recall stories about this from from your grandparents, but this is a hymnal, and we have them in the pews today. So uh, we're going to be using those. You can if you don't have one, Bill has some more that uh, he'd be glad to uh, give you. Just raise your hand if you need one. This morning, uh, uh, if, if you do miss the slides, they will be available on the recording later. I don't know why they work on the recording and not in here, but you know, I'll blame the Apple Corporation at this point. Right now, <laughs> right now, let's turn our attention to the psalm this morning, Psalm 112, verses 1 through 9. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He is dispersed abroad. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. Let's stand this morning and do turn in your hymnals to number 392 and let's sing together, Holy Spirit, Light Divine. Holy Spirit, Light Divine, shine upon this heart of mine. Chase the shades of night away, turn my darkness into day. Holy Spirit, power divine, cleanse this guilty heart of mine. Long has sin without control, held dominion o'er my soul. Holy Spirit, joy divine, cheer the sad and heart of mine. Bid my many woes depart, heal my wounded, bleeding heart. Holy Spirit, all divine, dwell within this heart of mine. Cast down every idol throne, reign supreme and reign alone. Amen. You may be just, you may be seated. We do have a couple of uh, folks specifically that I'm going to be lifting up this morning. I know that uh, we have others among us, some other folks who uh, uh, have struggled uh, in the recent weeks with, uh, with ongoing health things, and so we certainly want to be praying for, for all of those this morning. 
Uh, I, there are a couple of folks that I'm thinking of this morning. Of course, we have Don and Nell who continually have, have uh, uh, health issues that they're struggling with. Uh, Ken Tindall told me this past week that, that he has, uh, I believe it's his dad's brother, so I think that's Ken's uncle. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. I know it's a relation of Ken somehow, uh, but his, whoever these folks are, uh, they are struggling. They're having some, uh, uh, some ongoing health issues as well. I think those folks are on the, on the new prayer list that's coming out this next week, so certainly we'll be in prayer for those. Uh, our our shut-ins who, uh, uh, specifically Jewel and Laverne, who are unable to, uh, to get out and to be anywhere. Uh, I know we have others in that, in that boat as well, Mr. Bartiman and, and uh, the Atkinsons and others. So uh, continually be in prayer for those folks, if you will. Uh, for our, our folks who are going through, uh, whether it's uh, chemo, whether it's just illness, whatever it might be, but for Sue, for Sherlon, for Donna, for Sally, for Choice, uh, I know I hate naming names because I always forget somebody. And if I have forgotten you this morning, I, I sincerely and deeply apologize. But certainly continue to be in, in prayer for these folks. I know that Louise Frosch told me last week that uh, she's been fighting a, a pretty severe bacterial infection for the last few weeks, maybe longer than that. So continue to be in prayer for Louise, if you will. Uh, also, and we have a number of folks who are traveling this morning. The Tyndalls, the Kays, uh, Bede, and, and Mark are, uh, are on the road today as well. And I know that this is the season as summer wraps up, as, as we're getting ready for various things to get back to whatever the new normal is going to be, that we have a few folks who are going to be taking some trips and doing some things. So certainly be in prayer for those who will be on the road. Uh, so good to see the Sanders with us this morning. Certainly be praying for you guys as, uh, as you're traveling today. And I know that, that it's a, a blessing for us to have you here. And I know it's a blessing for your family for uh, you to be here as well. We are continually told throughout the scriptures to bring our concerns, our burdens before the Lord. Because we know that he is the one who's able to deal with all of those. Uh, Sometimes we wonder, does God ever hear my prayer? Does it ever go beyond the ceiling? Because it seems as if nothing ever changes. But the reality is that God is with us. God knows exactly what's going on all the time. He is constantly aware of the things that are going on in our lives, around our lives. In him is our hope and our strength. And if we are looking anywhere else for that, we will always be disappointed. Always, always, when our faith is in Christ, always we know that he is the one who is being that solid rock for our life to be built upon. He is that one who is helping and shaping and protecting. And so this morning we bring these needs to him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to bring these needs, these things, these folks that we've mentioned and the things that they're going through. Uh, specifically to you this morning. I know that there are others in this congregation and, and out for the folks who are watching this, this right now. We ask, Father, that whatever those needs are, we pray that as they are being brought, uh, being brought before you right now, we ask, Lord God, that you will meet those needs, that you will remind us that you are the one who gives strength when we need it. You are the one who offers your grace. You are the one who protects and helps. You are the one who is shaping us and molding us that we might become a reflection of who you are. We thank you, Father, for all of the ways that you encourage us, for all of the ways, Lord God, that you are at work. I pray for those folks today, Lord, uh, who are caregivers, who fall into that role of being caregivers for, for someone. And I ask, Lord God, that you will give these folks an extra measure of your grace Extend to them, Father God, the, the strength physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually that they need in order to continue to do the job of caring for a loved one. Lord, we, we pray for our shut-ins. I know it's been very difficult to try to go and see or to communicate with, uh, with a lot of our shut-ins. And so, Father, we ask that you will just help them. Wrap your arms around them, Lord God. Shelter them under your wings, as the psalmist wrote. Wrap your arms around them. Let them know that you are nearby. Hug them for us, Lord God. Help them to know that they are loved and that they are missed. And Father, thank you 
that our hope is in you. Thank you, Father, that you are the one who redeems, that you are the one who, whose grace we depend upon, that you are the one who forgives that you are the one who teaches and instructs us, that you are the one who helps us to love one another as you have loved us. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the word from Scripture again, from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 58, verses 6 through 12. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, do you cover him and not hide yourself from your, from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall call, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn, in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. This is the word of the Lord. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 549 and stand again, sing together. Higher ground, I'm pressing on the upward way. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Come with me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts and me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane. That I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. 
Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Let's remain standing and uh, recite together our confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 You may be seated. <clears throat> Our reading from the New Testament this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. That's right. Sorry. Yes, starting in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. Mm. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Hmm. A few weeks ago, we sang the song that we're going to sing now uh, in, uh, in our service. Uh, it's a, a familiar words uh, to, that, uh, that you'll recognize uh, to, were you there? Uh, the words are, the verses are in order. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? And then the triumphant last verse, were you there when he rose up from the dead? Josh has written uh, an alternative melody for this, for this uh, particular hymn. We sang it a few weeks ago, and you may recall uh, some of it. But recall those words as we sing together. Uh, we don't have the words in front of you, but they are, they are s that simple. So let's stand together and let's sing this song and just hear it together this morning. Were you there when they crucified? 
satisfied, my Lord. Were you there when they crucified, my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Were you there when they crucified, my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? from the dead Were you there when he rose up from the dead Oh Sometimes I feel like shouting glory Were you there when he rose up from the be seated. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. As our summer winds down, that's, that's a joke because it's still, what, 100 degrees outside? As summer winds down, so does our trip through the parables. This uh, series was never meant to be, and it's nowhere close to being, a comprehensive look at all of the parables of Jesus. I have a book in my office that's entitled All the Parables of Jesus, and it's like that thick. It's a great old big book, and it's commentary and different things on each of the parables of Jesus. We're not going to do all of them. It's never meant to be that kind of thing. Uh, In in fact, just a little confession, uh, up until Tuesday of this week, there was a big split in, in, in my mind as far as where we were going to go with, with this morning. It could have gone one way or another, and uh, uh, prayerfully, uh, the Lord has led me down this path for today. So that's where we're, uh, where we're going to be here in this uh, parable dealing with salt and light for today. But the fact is there are so many good parables throughout the Gospels. There are so many important lessons that Jesus needs his disciples to learn. So many encouraging words that he desires to speak into their lives. And so many corrections that he's still making in each of our lives. So what have we seen? as we've traveled through the parables of Jesus. Well, to be honest with you, the most prevalent type of parable that we've come across has uh, been found in in the Gospel of Matthew. It's been what has been referred to as kingdom parable. Uh, That fact shouldn't be too surprising since one of the things that Matthew does throughout his Gospel is to kind of demonstrate this clash of kingdoms, if you will. There is this, this... sense of the kingdom of God entering into the reality of this world in order to overthrow and displace the kingdoms of this world. That's, that's a theme throughout Matthew's gospel. The kingdom parable is the parable that starts out with Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is like, and we've seen many examples of that. Uh, we talked about leaven 
being small but irresistible in its power. We've talked about the kingdom of God being like a hidden treasure or a, a pearl of great price, uh, things that are worth giving up everything for, things that are worth pursuing wholeheartedly. We've talked about how the kingdom of God is like a king giving a feast for his son's wedding and inviting everyone in, but then also recognizing that it's the king who provides everything that is necessary. And if we try to provide for ourselves, then we are dishonoring the king and, in fact, don't have a place at the table. We've also seen beyond the kingdom parables, we've seen the immensity of God's love as we looked at the parable that I like to call the waiting father that most people know as the prodigal son. Uh, we've seen how God's immense love is to be taken to the world, how we are to see everyone in the world as a needy neighbor. And that's, that was the message that we received from the parable of the Good Samaritan. And last week we saw that the deciding factor that separates the righteous sheep from the unrighteous goats is whether or not the immense love that God has poured into our lives is actually being shared with others. So all of these parables have spoken about various things to do with, with God's work in this world, God's redeeming work of bringing about his kingdom in our midst, and God's work also of reshaping us, helping us to, to realize that God is setting the world right side up, not turning the world upside down. Sin has turned the world upside down. But God is in the process of setting all things right. And that's the, the thing that, that all of these parables lead us to. It is that understanding of what God is doing. It's taking that, that very simple story, a story of things that we can understand, of things that we can see, and of using those very simple processes, those very simple things, and explaining a huge spiritual principle with them. Now, our parables for today, and I say parables because this is actually a joined pair here in Matthew chapter 5, speak about the responsibility that Jesus' disciples have as they are being made a part of God's kingdom, as they are being brought into God's kingdom. We start in Matthew 5.13. It's a short passage, but there is, like in the case of every parable, there is so much contained in these very few verses. Let's start reading verse 13. <clears throat> you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, the next few verses continue this. We're not going to read those next few verses, but if you have your Bibles, uh, you go th back through this passage over this next week, I encourage you to look at the next few verses all the way just down to verse 20. It's really uh, a, a good stopping point for that because it's an introductory for the next section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount there. But it's talking about the idea of, of bringing in the righteousness of God into this world through the lives of the disciples. Now, while this is not necessarily a complex parable, it is a good parable for us to use to kind of sum up Jesus's instructions to his disciples. There's very little in this parable that needs to be explained in terms of culture or time changes. I, I hesitate to think of how many sermons have been preached over the years, of how many illustrations have been used in talking about salt and light. My guess is a lot, a whole bunch. Uh, some of you marked down, I almost called Sally this week. I know Sally's one of those who over the years has marked down various times, and she'll come to me after the service and say, and say Preacher, you preached from that back in 2001 and in 2004 and in 2008. and in, That's great. Thank you. It reminds me that, ooh, maybe I better look at some other things. <laughs> but uh, I know that over the years, I've preached my own fair share of sermons from this passage. And Sally, you can tell me after the service this morning. But it's amazing to me that we go back to this idea, we go back to this theme that the disciples, 
the followers of Jesus, you and I, who are placing their faith in Christ, who have heard, who have responded to the grace of God, who are walking in a relationship with God through Christ Jesus, that there continues to be this call in our life to be salt and light. Salt of the world, salt of the earth, light to the world. Those two themes kind of sum up for all of us, what it means to walk as a disciple, what it is to live as a follower of Jesus. We still use salt. We understand that salt is a vital part of our world. If, our, if the balance of potassium or salt, however you want to say that, in our system gets out of whack, it can cause some serious health problems for us. Salt is vital. If it weren't for salt, at work in our bodies, if we didn't have salt present in our bodies, water couldn't properly move between the cell membranes. Did you know that? It's, it's one of those things. And if you have too much of it, your whole body just kind of goes crazy. Salt is a vital part of our chemical makeup and the way that God formed us to begin with. It's there. It's present. It's necessary. It's necessary. We still use salt. We're aware of the properties of salt to cleanse, to purify, to preserve, and to heal. When I was a kid and I'd have a sore throat, my first thing my mom would tell me to do, gargle with salt water. I'd go and gargle, get some warm salt water and gargle with salt water. Still do that. Have an ulcer in my mouth. Go gargle with salt water. Have a, a cold and have, and have drainage. Go gargle with salt water. Have an ingrown toenail. Go soak it in. You thought I was going to say gargle with salt water, didn't you? Go, soak it in warm salt water. I almost did say gargle, just to see if you were listening. But we do. Salt has all of these, chem all of these uh, properties, all of these ways that we understand that salt works. And the people in Jesus' day understood that salt was good for those things as well. In the day before refrigeration, meat was salted. It was preserved that way because salt would inhibit or prevent the bacterial growth. Now, if bacteria had already started growing in there, it wouldn't cleanse it, but it would keep bacteria from growing there in the first place. Uh, there are a few differences, at least two differences that I can think of between what salt was used for in Jesus' day versus what it was used for today. Uh, first of all, salt was used as a currency. The Roman soldiers got paid with a measure of salt with their, with their money every month or week or however it was that they got paid. This uh, was known as a salary. I don't know how many of you have ever heard that word or how many of you still are getting that particular salary. Hopefully it's not a little measure of salt that you're getting every week. Second, salt was often collected when seawater evaporated from little areas, little pools. During the rainy season, these pools would come up, and then as the, as the weather dried out, remember Israel is a whole lot like, uh, like parts of Texas as far as climate goes. And so you'd have rainy seasons and you'd have pools of water. And then during the dry season, those pools would evaporate and any kind of minerals or salts that were in the ground would kind of form a crust and you could go and you could gather that crust. And a lot of people still do that to this day in, in parts of uh, the Middle East. They'll go and they'll, they'll collect these, these salt deposits and they'll sell them. The problem is you get all kinds of dissolved minerals in those salt. It's not a chemically... Uh, stable formula like we get whenever we buy a thing of Morton salt uh, from the grocery store. It's a mixture of different things. You have some gypsum, you have some, some other dissolved minerals, you might have some, some organic material, and I'll let your mind kind of wonder as to what that might be, that gets dissolved in there also. And so if you get some of this diluted salt, the salt loses its saltiness, it loses its flavor, if you will. It loses its potency. And this diluted salt, Jesus says, is good for nothing except to fill potholes with. You throw it out in the street and it gets trampled down into the street. In this way, that losing of saltiness describes those who, those followers of Jesus who were diluted, not diluted, but diluted by their unwillingness to give themselves fully to Jesus as Lord of their lives. These have lost the potency of being God's people. As such, 
Nothing purifying or healing or tasty can be found in the lives of these people who are trying to live with one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. There's, there's none of that. God tells us, put away the things of this world. Come out of this world. Come to me. Abide fully and completely in me. That's the call of the disciple. And the one who's trying to, to live a diluted life ends up having a life that offers nothing satisfying to the world. There is one function of salt that almost never gets talked about, and that's the function of preventing the growth of seeds or, or various things. In Judges chapter 9, one of Gideon's sons punished a city for refusing to follow him as king. Now, never mind <laughs> that the son was in the wrong for trying to set himself up as a ruler in the first place. When this city refused to follow him, the city was used and is, as an example for the rest of Israel. All of the, all of the men were killed in this city. And then uh, Gideon's son went through and he sowed salt in the fields. And the purpose of doing that was to kill all of the crops that were there. And it also prevented new crops, new seeds from being planted. Can you imagine? I mean, he completely, not only did he wipe out all the men of the city, but then he basically erased the possibility of this city being able to rise up again. He did this as a form of punishment for the city because they refused to follow him and his own selfishness. Now, if you go back and you read the rest of Judges chapter 9, you know that this man ended up uh, being found guilty and judged by the rest of the nation because he had been judged by God, first of all being found guilty of doing all of these things, and it, was, it didn't end well for him. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. But historically, there have been several other military leaders who have done the same kind of salting the earth kind of thing in order to assure that their enemies would never be able to rise up against them in the future. Well, how does this function of salt, how can it possibly, something so negative, tie into the possibility of describing the life of a follower of Jesus. Bear with me here. I think that the saltiness of being in a growing, maturing relationship with God means that there is no room for a seed of sin or a root of bitterness to grow in our lives or within the community of our believers. If we are truly in that relationship, in God's holiness, God's, God's holy love is permeating every aspect of our lives, it's that saltiness of having God in this place and God in our lives that is preventing the further spread of any kind of, of sinful activity or any kind of division that can rise up among us. You are, Jesus said, salt of the earth. The other description of Jesus' disciples here is as light of the world. In the previous chapter, Matthew has shown that Jesus himself has has completed or is completing what Isaiah had said that Messiah would do. Messiah would bring light to those who sat in darkness and for those who lived in the shadow of death. That's the job of Messiah. And that's what we see in Matthew chapter 4, at the end of Matthew chapter 4. Those folks who have lived in darkness now have seen a great light. That sounds like an Advent scripture, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it might be. But there's that theme, again, of light shining into the darkness. And now, Jesus tells his followers, you are meant to reflect the light that God brings to your life into the lives of others. Messiah is that source of light. God is that one at work there. God in human form at work. He is that source of light. We then become those who reflect that light to the world around us. In the similar way that the moon reflects the light of the sun, so too are we as followers of Jesus, to reflect the glory and the, and the revealed truth and the revealed majesty of who God is to the world around us. We don't reject the world. We don't hide from the world. We take this light of knowing and serving God into the darkness of a world that is blinded by the darkness of sin and the worship of self. 
while salt has a multitude of attributes that we have to take into consideration when we talk about salt of the world, salt of the earth, light really has only one, and that is to reveal. A city on a hill and a lamp in a small house, both are examples that Jesus used. The idea of a city sat on a hill, and I'm have no doubt that his disciples would have thought of Jerusalem, that great city set up on, on the top of, of Mount Zion and overlooked the entire area. Everyone could see it, no matter where you were. If, it was, if there were lights on in the city, if it was one of those festival times, if it was especially the Feast of Lights, you would know that that was going on because you could see from a great distance all of the lights, all the ways that the city was lit up. I don't know how many of you have ever traveled uh, out in, in West Texas or in, West, in the western United States. But it seems like you can drive sometimes at night. You can drive for hours and hours and hours and only be illuminated. The road is only illuminated by the light of the, the stars or the light of the moon. And then all of a sudden you top a hill. I remember the first time this happened to me, uh, we were driving into, driving into Denver. And I remember we topped a hill and there was all of Denver spread out in front of us. The lights of the entire city lit up that entire area. And it lets you know there's a sense of hope that kind of tells you that, oh, wow, the end of my journey is almost here. It's not going to be darkness forever. There is a place that I am heading toward. There's a hotel room that I can lay my head down on a pillow for a few hours before I have to get up and keep going on on my journey. But there is a sense of hope that is brought to us by the idea of a city that's set up on a hill. And Jesus says, you can't hide that. He says, how many of you in your own houses, you have to understand that we're talking about like, like small, pretty much windowless houses. How many of you would light a lamp in your house and then immediately put it out again? How many of you, Jesus said, would light a lamp only to put a basket over it, to hide that light, to hide that. I keep watching to see if any smoke's going to come up. It's okay. I'm watching. Some of the rest of you are watching too. Woo, look at that. No fire. Some of the rest, uh, no, 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 that was a thought, not on my notes. But the idea of if you have a light, if you have gone to the trouble of lighting a light, I pulled out my handy-dandy little candle lighter, and boom, it was lit. But in the days when you didn't have that kind of technology, in the days where you had a flint and a steel or, or some other way uh, that you had to go through the process of making a spark in order to create a flame, why would you go through all that trouble? Why would you trim your wick? Why would you fill your lamp with oil? Why would you then strike a flint? Why would you do all of that stuff to light a lamp only then to cover it up, to make it of no use, potentially put it out or set your basket on fire, one or the other? The idea then, <laughs> sorry, I smelled a little smoke that time. The idea, I'm not going to do that anymore. The idea there, Jesus' disciples would have laughed at that. Just as you're laughing at me this morning. They would have found that ridiculous. Why would we begin the process of following Jesus? Why would we recognize that he is the light of the world? Why would we see the light that he is shining into the world around us and and recognize that we stand in need of him, of his forgiveness, of God's forgiveness that is found through Christ? Why would we go through that process of, of asking for forgiveness, of receiving from him that forgiveness, and then only hide that relationship with him? Why would we do that? Why would we refuse to live our lives in such a way that God's goodness is seen? Why would we want to go back to darkness when we have experienced the joy of being in God's light? What is revealed to the world through the life of the disciple, the one who, is, who has God's light shining in his life, who is allowing God's light to be reflected back to the world through her life? What is revealed to the world through the life of the disciple? God. 
It is the calling of every disciple, the calling of every disciple to reveal God's presence, God's grace, God's redemptive power to others as God continues his work of shaping us over time. Jesus points out the foolishness of lighting a lamp, of starting to know God, and then hiding that lamp. And he says, why would you possibly want to do that? As we close up this parable today, let me ask this question. Does the parable of salt and light still make sense to us to describe our lives as disciples and followers of Jesus today? If we are living in relationship with God, if we are enjoying the savor of God's holiness in our life, then yes, it does. It makes perfect sense to us. We understand this. If our lives reflect to the world the light of what God has revealed about himself, then yes, that is. That's us. That describes us. As disciples of Jesus, our responsibility is to live in such a way that God is glorified in all that we do and through all that we do. As the salt of God's holy love flavors and purifies and cleanses our lives, we are able then to live in such a way that others see God's holy love active through our choices as our life shines out God's love and presence to the world around us. In doing that, we are not drawing attention to ourselves. We are not trying to set ourselves up. We don't want anybody to see us in that process. As disciples, we reflect the light of God into the darkness of the world around us. We still have the same calling. We still have the same responsibility today that Jesus said of his disciples so long ago to live as salt of the earth and as light of the world. Let's sing our final hymn together this morning. Turn to number 668 in your hymnals. We'll sing I'll Go Where You Want Me to Go. Key words to hear in light of our message today is I'll be what you want me to be, Lord. Let's stand together and sing. not be on the mountain's height over the stormy sea. It may not be at the battle's front, my Lord will have need of me. But if by a still small voice he calls to pass that I do not know, I'll answer, dear Lord, with my hand in thine I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, or a mountain or a plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord, I'll be what you want me to be. Perhaps today there are loving words which Jesus would have me speak. There may be now, in the paths of sin, some wonder whom I should seek. O oh, Savior, if Thou wilt be my guide, though dark and rugged the way, my voice shall echo the message sweet, I'll say what You want me to say. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord, I'll be what you want me to be. There's surely somewhere a lonely place in earth's harvest field so wide. Where I may labor through life's short day For Jesus the crucified 
So trusting my all to thy tender care, and knowing thou lovest me, I'll do thy will with a heart sincere, I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over a mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord, I'll be what you want me to be. Remain standing. Let us pray. Father, you have instructed us today through the prayers, through the songs, through the scripture, through the preaching. You have instructed us that we have a responsibility to live as your disciples. This was true, Jesus, when you walked this earth. It's still true for those of us who follow you today. Our responsibility, our calling is to to demonstrate to others that same love, to live out with that saltiness of life, with that flavorful life that can only come from knowing God's presence in our lives. It's to shine that light, that hope, of redemption, of forgiveness into the world around us. Father, thank you for the work that you continue to do in us. Thank you, Father, for the responsibility that you continue to give to us to live as your people. That's not just true for me. That's not just true for Sam. That's true for each and every one of us, everyone who's hearing my voice this morning. As a follower of Jesus, we have this calling. We have this responsibility. Help us, Lord God, to know that what you have said is real and is true and is vital for the world in which we live. Thank you, Father, for bringing us here this morning. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity for us to be able to have a situation where we can pray for one another, where we can grow in your truth. And now, Father, thank you for the opportunity that you give us to be sent out into this world, to be sent out with this message of hope to be sent out in a way, Lord God, where you use us as examples of those who are following you. We trust you, Lord God, and we thank you that as you send us, we know that you are going with us. Thank you, Father, for this fact. Thank you, Lord God, for the continuing presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives and the continuing work that you are doing through each of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sending song today is Lord Dismiss Us With Thy Blessing, hymn number 237, if you'd like to turn there. Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Fill our hearts with joy and peace. Let us each thy love possessing Triumph in redeeming grace O refresh us, O refresh us Traveling through this wilderness Thanks we give an adoration For thy gospel's joyful sound May the fruits of thy salvation in our hearts and loves abound. Ever faithful, ever faithful, to thy truth may we be found. You are dismissed. Go with God. <laughs>